Well, good morning, everyone. The 2021 Masters Tournament is officially <coughs> underway as Lee Elder joined Jack Nicholas and Gary Player in an historic, emotional, and joyous honorary starter ceremony just a few minutes ago. Back in November, if you will remember, Chairman Fred Ridley announced a momentous new initiative in creating two scholarships to student athletes, one for the men's golf team and one for the women's golf team at Payne College here in Georgia, a nationally renowned Black Institute of Higher Learning. These scholarships will forever be in the honor of Lee Elder. The chairman also extended at this time in no last November a special invitation to Mr. Elder to join Gary Player and Jack Nicholas ceremoniously to start the 2021 Masters Tournament. In 1975, Lee Elder was the first black man to compete in the Masters and appeared another five times in the Masters. Mr. Elder, it is our great honor and privilege to welcome you to the Media Center today. It is also with the greatest of pleasure and honor to welcome back our two legendary winners of the green jacket and indeed le legendary icons in sport, six-time Masters champion Jack Nicklaus and three-time Masters champions Gary Player. Now, gentlemen, before we open it up to questions, I would like each of you to discuss that significant moment and emotion experienced by each of you just a few minutes ago at the first tee. And if I may, Mr. Elder, we would like to start with you. If you would share with us your emotions in that ceremony and what it means to you today. Well, I certainly want to say thank you so very much for this great opportunity. For me and my family, I, I think it uh, was one of the most emotional experiences that I have ever witnessed, I've been involved in. It is certainly something that I will cherish for the rest of my life because I have loved coming to Augusta National and playing here the times that I have played here with many of my friends that are members here and at the request and invitation of Brother, Brother Johnson, who have also helped me. But for me, my heart is very soft this morning. Not heavy, soft. Soft because of the wonderful things that I have encountered since, since arriving here on Monday and being able to see some of the great friends that I have made over the past years, especially like these two gentlemen that are here. We've competed against each other, and we have certainly enjoyed a lot of pleasant moments. And I just want to say thank you so very much uh, to have me here. It's a great honor, and I cherish it very much, and I will always cherish it. And I want to thank the chairman for extending me this great privilege. Thank you. Mr. Nicholas, would you uh, please share with us your sentiments and emotions about this morning? Well, I think that uh, uh, having Lee there was uh, uh, the right thing to do, a nice thing to do. Thank you. And uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, I told Lee if, if he could hit it, hit it off, hit the tee, he says there was no way in the world he wouldn't outdrive me. And he said, he said no. And I said, well, then, then, then I get you by three yards because you didn't hit. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I think it was, it was, it's always a nice experience to open up the Masters. And uh, uh, Gary and I have had the privilege of doing that for a few years. It's, uh, it's fun. Uh, I, walked on the, I walked on the tee and Phil Mickelson and Bubba Watson were there. And uh, I, said, uh, I said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. I says. Let me know if you can see the golf ball, because if you can see the golf ball, it means I've gone beyond the bottom of the hill after I hit it. That means I hit a really long one, maybe 130 yards. So I could see the ball. That was, that was good. But Gary had a nice tee shot, and, and I, I slopped it out there somewhere. But anyway, it was, uh, uh, it's always a nice experience, and it's, uh, it was great to have 
to do to share that first tee with Lee and uh, Gary. Mr. Blair, may we have your comments about this historic moment? Yes, a very historic moment uh, for me. Uh, I've had the privilege of having a great friend and a man that I admire so much in Jack Nicklaus, the greatest gentleman that ever played golf, without a question. With Lee Elder, who experienced a lot of things that I experienced in my life, not to dwell into them to any extent, but in 1969, I think it was, as we get older, we don't remember the, all the intricacies and details, but it was in that year that I invited Lee Elder to come to South Africa. And it's quite sad to think that in those days, with the segregation policy that South Africa had, that I had to go to my president and get permission for Lee Elder to come and play in our PGA. Quite sad. But things have progressed since we had that wonderful man, Nelson Mandela, one of the greatest leaders the world's ever had. Lee Elder came down and he was put under an enormous amount of pressure by people in this country, mainly black people, understandably. And I was called a traitor. Lee Elder, on his way to South Africa, won the Nigerian Open, came to South Africa, played in our PGA, got standing ovations. We then went on to other venues, and he and his wife Rose at that time visited universities and really contributed to the country in a great deal. You can imagine at that time in history how encouraging it was for a young black boy to see this champion playing. And then, of course, with Tiger Woods coming on, it was just absolutely fantastic for the people of any color around the world. It always amazed me that presidents of the United States would be giving these different awards to athletes for their athletic prowess. And here was a man that changed the lives and changed and put a spoke in the wheel of, a, of segregation in South Africa and was never given the awards that he actually duly deserved. He got the Bobby Jones Award, which was Jack and I were there. And to be bestowed upon and be giving this award here today, which he deserves so richly. But when you do something for the human being and for freedom, which unfortunately is dying in the world at a rapid pace right now, it is a very historic moment for me. And to also to see Phil Mickelson and Baba Watson on that tee brought back memories because I used to go and watch Jock Hutchinson tee off before I played. And that just goes and endorses the fact that they have such respect for this game that has unified people around the world to such an extent. It's quite unbelievable. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Let's open it up for questions, please. Doug? year and, and what do you think will be the strongest memory you take away from today? Well, in 1975, the strongest memory, as, as, as I recall, was how nervous I was going to the first tee. But I was fortunate enough to play with a gentleman that I had known for quite some time, Gene Littler. He, we had sat in the shop for just a few minutes to talk as we was walking out to the first tee. And he said uh, to me, he said, Lee, I know this is going to be a hard day for you, but I just want you to know that if I get in your way, just shout at me because I have a tendency to do those things. I had a wonderful round that day. I got to, to my, my way of thinking about playing the golf course because it's at that time for me, it was a, a golf course that I was not familiar with. And I was very happy to shoot the 74 I did uh, that particular day. But what I, what I remember so much about my first visit here was the fact that every tee and every green that I walked on, I got tremendous ovations. And I think when you 
receive something like that, it have to help settle you down. Because I tell you, I was so nervous as we began to, as we began play, that it took me a few holes to kind of calm down. But getting those wonderful ovations and seeing a lot of the great friends that I had here with me at that particular time, it gave me a chance to concentrate a little bit more on the game because I was not just look, up looking around to see if whom I could see. I was able to stick with business. But I think really it was a situation of kind of looking around because it was such a beautiful day and all the cherry blossom had bloomed and everything was so beautiful. But I still had to concentrate on, on the game of golf, which was hard for me to do. I think that on several occasions, as I thought about where I was at and where I had came from, was certainly something that was a reminder, a reminder of, hey, you worked for this, you have now, you have now achieved it. Just relax and enjoy it and enjoy the moment. It, <clears throat> your life is not going to depend on how well you play. You don't have to be worrying about carrying anyone on your shoulder. You know, you did this all your own. This was a goal that you had set for yourself. You have achieved it. So now relax and play some golf and just enjoy the moment. Those are the great memories that I will always have of coming here and playing at Augusta for the first time. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Mr. Player. Um, I heard when you were. Raise your hand, yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sorry. Um, I heard when you came down Magnolia Lane this morning with your grandsons that you turned the radio down just to take in the moment. What was going through your mind when you sat there in silence and, and took it all in? Well, what applies every year. Uh, having played in it 52 times, which is an incredible experience and an honor. Uh, most times I've walked up the avenue. Today I didn't because we had to be here at a specific time. Most times I've walked up that in a, in a sign of gratitude, just to realize how lucky I am to be in this great country. Because I've traveled more miles than any human being that's ever lived now. And what these eyes have seen, not one American and 350 million people have seen around the world. And to be playing at this great golf course, this wonderfully organized tournament, which changes one's life when you win it. So it is just a sign of gratitude and a sign of thank you to the man above for letting me have that privilege bestowed upon me. Yes, sir. Third row over here, sir. Yes. Um, this is a meaningful day uh, over here, a uh, meaningful day for lots of people, uh, including a lot of the older black caddies who used to work the tournament, uh, many of whom are still alive and living in Augusta. And I wonder um, if each of you could recount some memories maybe of uh, pre-1982 and, and some of these caddies and, and uh their ability to read greens, et cetera, uh, what they meant to you? Well, it certainly, it certainly has uh, meant a lot to me because I was so happy to see uh, them come about and, and be able to uh, uh, compete and achieve the things that they have been able to achieve. I certainly have enjoyed competing against a lot of them that are uh, that have come from the caddy ranks like I did to perhaps pursue a career uh, in the professional game. It just have taken a little bit longer because of the circumstances of not being able to uh, uh, really accumulate and get the type of money that it takes to play on the tour. But for me personally, I am just so thrilled to know that they did continue to work at it and Try and trying to pursue a career uh, in the professional ranks. I know that I have been able to compete against a lot of them and have made uh, good friendships with them. And 
I certainly will continue to uh, do my, my best to continue uh, and do whatever I can do to further enhance black golf into the professional ranks. Yes, ma'am, in the back, please. No, he wanted us to. Yeah, yeah. If, yes. yeah I, you know, my experience here is I came here first time in 1959, and uh, I had a, I had a, a fellow from, uh, actually came from, uh, I don't know how much he caddied here, but he caddied here, <coughs> from, from Atlanta named Pond. And uh, Pond, so that's all I know about it, knew him by, caddied for me the first year, and uh, I played decently, but didn't make the cut. And uh, the next year I came back, and it was in. The, I remember Freddie was in the in the, the caddy master. Said, "Pond, Mr. Nicholas is here." He says, "He's he's he's ready to get out and go play." And he says, "I well, I I don't I don't want a caddy for Mr. Nicholas. <laughs> why you why why don't you want a caddy for Mr. Nicholas?" <laughs> He he worked too hard. He says he comes too early and he leaves too late. I don't want to do that. And so so Freddie looked, Freddie looked in the room and he said, "Is there anybody here who would like to catch me?" And, and Willie Peterson raised his hand. And he said, "I'm not afraid of working." So so Willie came with him. Willie was with me for five of my Masters wins. So uh, uh, you know Willie caddied for me until and I'm, I'm sure Pond has got to have been passed by now. And of course, Willie passed away. I don't know, fifteen years ago, maybe. And uh, <laughs> Willie was a, Willie was a. I mean, he was a great personality. I mean, the trouble that Willie got into it was only. I, I don't know. I don't know who it was matched by, but it, it was hard to match. <laughs> but Willie was a wonderful guy. I love I love Willie, and uh, uh, he. Uh, I, I miss him, but it's. Uh, you know that that was the experience when you came to Augusta, that you had an Augusta caddy, and you had somebody who uh, knew what was going on. Willie never read a green for me. Willie never picked a club out of the bag, but Willie sure was enthusiastic. <laughs> 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 the, the putt I made at uh, the putt I made in '75 on the 16th hole, Willie started waving his towel, <laughs> and when he started waving, he waved it right down as the ball went in the hole. He missed the ball by about that point. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was wonderful. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, having been uh, first time in 1957, and I arrive here, and there's a uh, caddy. His name was Ernest Nipper. And today, in spite of my son sitting here who's caddied for me and some of my grandchildren, he was the best caddy I ever had. He was a very good golfer. He lived here. He knew these greens inside out. And I vividly remember getting on to the fourth hole. And I had a putt of about six foot for a par from the left-hand side of the cup. And the flag was back left. And I said, Nipper, I said, this is left lip. He says, Black Knight, this is on the right lip. I said, eh, it's not, it's on the left lip. He says, if it's not on the right lip, you don't have to pay me. I said, no, I'm convinced. <laughs> and I looked right in the middle. And then I come back here in 1978, and uh, Eddie McCoy is my caddy. As I arrive, he says, sit down, laddie, sit down, laddie. I said, what's the problem? He says, man, I need a roof on my house. I've got a lot of children, and I don't have a roof, and I don't have the cash, man. He says, let's dash for the cash this weekend. I said, we will get you a roof on your house. And I'm seven behind Tom Watson, and I shoot a 30 on the back nine and come back in 64 and win. And when I hold that putt on the last hole, which is the most significant putt of my career, man, he would have won the Olympic high jump <laughs> champion without a question of a doubt. So we all have wonderful memories, and Arnold had great memories. Everybody had great memories with these caddies that played a vital role in this tournament. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Elder, I, I wanted to know just how you chose golf, a sport that at the time wouldn't have appeared, you know, all that welcoming to people of color. So what, why golf? And then, Jack, if you could just, what, what do you remember of his 1975 appearance? Obviously, you have great memories of that year, but I'd love to know if there's anything specific about his appearance. Which one are you? Me first? 
Well, uh, coming up out of the rural area of Dallas, Texas, as a caddy, where I first started, and was fortunate enough to move to Los Angeles, where I had a chance to uh, to compete in the game. I had no idea uh, where I would uh, would land as far as the, my professional career was concerned, because uh, I did not have the uh, great idea about becoming a professional golfer at, at the time. At the time, I was just primarily trying to be a good golfer because if you played uh, around a lot of the places that I played, you had better to be a good golfer, especially if you were trying to hustle a buck or two because there are so many bandits that was out there. And when I speak of bandits, I'm talking about guys that were real good players that uh, always sit around and wait for uh, somebody to come along. And when they found out that I was a pretty good player, all of them wanted to kind of be partners with me. But that was, that was the only way that we as black players uh, had a chance to go and this was on a, uh, these was all public courses that we were playing. So these were the type of uh, courses that we had to kind of tune our game to. And I think that the one thing that really helped me was the fact that I ran into a player, a player that had played the, had played the tour in the name, by the name of Ted Rhodes, who kind of took me under his wing and kind of was my mentor and tutored me and worked and worked hard right with me. I mean, when I was hitting balls, he was hitting balls because he was still playing. But I think that uh, as far as the black players was concerned, coming along that at that particular time was certainly a, a, a hard time. It was a hard time even today, but I think it was much harder in that, in that sense because it was harder to get a good sponsor that would be willing to put up the type of money that it was going to take for you to play, uh, play on the tour. You either had to have a a family member with money, uh, play on the UGA tour, which I did, to uh, make enough money to come and play on the on the PGA tour, and I kind of just played along that on the UGA tour, with, went in tournaments here every now and then, and compete with a lot of the black professionals that are here today, and and be and coming good friends with them, even though I was dominating it pretty well, because in <clears throat> Just proud to me qualifying to go on the PGA Tour. I won 21 of 23 events in 1966 before I made the application to come on the PGA Tour. I accumulated enough money. At the time when I came on the tour, you had to show a bank statement of $6,500 in order to, <clears throat> to, to make an application to get your, your card. So I did that in the fall of 67. And then uh, a few years later, after coming on the tour, well, about a year and a half after that, I had a chance to play against this great man right here at Flystone in Akron, Ohio. And I think that really, I think that really prompted my career. I know after that, I began to uh, blossom pretty well. And I think that what happened is that it really changed my game because I knew that if I could play five extra holes with the great Jack Nicholas that I knew that I had arrived and that I could play on the tour. What year was that, Ray? 1969. That was 69? I robbed you, didn't I? Yeah. You did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You got, he got lucky. Because <laughs> I mean, the first hole I made, I made about a 30-footer. And, and <clears throat> you know, it was, three, it was three of us playing. Frank Beard was in that playoff. Yeah. But Jack and I both birded the first hole, so he fell out. Then uh, the battle went on. But being the great player that he were, he, he walked me down. Well, I, 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 it was certainly a, a wonderful and well, tremendous day for me. I had a lot of friends that had come uh, from Washington, D.C., over to Ohio to see us play, and it was just a great honor to, to have played with him. Thank you. Well, you know, you asked a couple of questions from me. One was 75 was the first year that Lee played. I, 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 could, I was kind of astonished when that was announced that, that 
that a black player hadn't played because Lee had certainly played well enough. And, you know, there, he, had, he had Teddy Rose before him and he had uh, Charlie Sifford before him and uh, uh, fellas who could well, could well have played uh, uh, been invited to the Masters. And I thought, you know, it was long overdue. Uh, when he did, when he finally got uh, uh, invited, the, the, the day Lee is talking about, we tied to the tournament, the three of us to play off, and I think I hold three straight putts <laughs> over 35 feet to stay in the playoff. <laughs> and then I got lucky enough to win, and I robbed him of a robbed him of that tournament, and uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget it because I mean it was like, uh, oh, I mean I have to hold that from here over there, boom, boom, boom. I, you, just, you just don't do that very often. But anyway, uh, uh, I think Lee has, uh, has represented himself very well and it's certainly, as I said, it was long overdue until he got here. And uh, I mean, the first, the first, let me go back, I look at the first tour tournament that I played in, I was an amateur at 18 years old and uh, I played at uh, Firestone, like same place, before they redid the golf course. Before they redid the golf course, and I played the first two rounds with Charlie Sifford there. And uh, I remember Charlie shot, uh, he shot 70-64 when we played. I shot 66-67 as an 18-year-old kid. And I'll, I'll never forget Charlie. And uh, <laughs> my dad and Charlie got talking, and Charlie had this cigar in his mouth all the time. My dad my dad was uh, had, had drugstores in Columbus, so he went back and forth, and he came back after we played the first round. He bought but Charlie, a, a box of cigars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I brought him back at the box of cigars. But I, my dad and Charlie became good friends forever. And uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's, I hope it answered your question. We have, excuse me, time for two more questions. We'll start with Jeff. Uh, this is for Mr. Player uh, over here, Gary. Being the uh, 60th anniversary of your first uh, win here at Augusta, uh, I would, trying to see if you would share a, your most vivid memory of the day. And secondly, what, what do you think, as you look at the global imprint of this tournament, what do you feel the role of the international champions has been in growing that footprint? Well, obviously, I vividly remember that, uh, being the first international player to win. And I obviously always had a desire to win the Grand Slam. And uh, playing here... And uh, it was Arnold Palmer who was the who was the icon, and but I prepared myself actually for years, mentally, um, uh, what's the word when you go into like a bit of a reverie? What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, like a yoga, what's the word I'm thinking of? You go into like a and but, no, it's the it's a button. Anyway, I prepared myself mentally because I knew playing with Arnold Palmer, the icon, which I understood because I grew up with him, uh, the, the screaming would go and how difficult it would be to beat him, to try and play, but to have these crowds so much pulling for him. So I prepared myself and I was ready. And it was such a, a sigh of relief to beat him. And, you know, a lot of people said, well, Arnold Palmer made a double bogey on the last hole. But I made a double bogey at 13 and a six at 15. But Sports Illustrated very kindly, you know, mentioned that. Of course, the other newspapers just said, oh, Arnold Palmer blew it. But there's nothing that says you do it on the first hole. The, every hole counts the same. So, and then uh, being the first international player to win was significant. And then obviously players after that, a host of them, realized, well, if Gary Player can do it with his size, I know I can do it. And we've had many of them come here and achieve that successfully. And the publicity that this golf tournament got through international players, yes, it was prevalent in the United States, but then it became well recognized around all these countries of what a great tournament it was. So again, I, I put great emphasis on what golf has done to change the world. I've seen what it's done in my country and all around the world, and it's fantastic. And, you know, when I played over here in 1969, you know, for me to see us going over the brink of bad times now into the good times and the positive times, 
um, is so rewarding because I played, and Jack will remember this because he played with me at Dayton, Ohio. They threw telephone books in my back, ice in my eyes, charged us on the green. We were on the 10th green, charged us, tore the green up and threw balls between my legs when I was putting and ice in my eyes, etc., etc. But I wasn't bitter as this man wasn't bitter. That's part of life. And to see how the athletes have progressed, $500 million, $100 million, the money they're making today. We've made great strides, and we've got to look at it in a very positive manner. And as our great hero Martin Luther King said, love outdoes hate. And we, I can see us now making great progress, and we've all got to continue along this vein. We'll conclude with uh, Jim. Uh, Lee, I'd like to ask you uh, what contact you might have had with historic figures like Jackie Robinson while you were in Los Angeles or Hank Aaron in Atlanta about coming and preparing you mentally and what you would have to endure after what they had gone through. Well, I had uh, uh, very small contact with, with Jackie because he was a, a little bit ahead of me when I came on the tour. But I had a chance to be with Hank Aaron on many occasions and talk to him because we was right around in that same era. And I had a chance to talk with him a lot of time. As a matter of fact, uh, we sit in his office uh, just not too long ago before he passed, and we reminisced about uh, 1976. I won at Milwaukee on Sunday, and he hit his 215th at at County Stadium uh, on Tuesday. But I had hosted many of his golf tournaments at Chateau Elan, his fundraisers that he had there for uh, money that he was uh, raising for the charity. Uh, Jackie was a person that I played golf with on several occasions, but he was not the type of person that was out and around the golf course because he was pretty much tied up with the baseball. Hank Aaron was, was a little more outgoing as far as golf was concerned, and I think that's the reason why my, my uh, rapport with him was much more because I had a chance to see him and play with him a little bit more than I did with Jackie. But they were both swell people, and we talked about several things. It uh, wasn't, wasn't anything as far as uh, doing anything but just probably but about our sports, our particular sport and the environment that we uh, felt that we could help other young blacks that was coming up behind us, and which they both did. And I certainly hope that the things that I have done have inspired a lot of young black players, and they will continue on with. But they were both great men. I didn't, like I said, I didn't spend much time with Jack, but. I spent quite a bit of time with Hank Aaron. I think the reason why I did that because I played most of my golf uh, around the Atlanta and area and then the Florida area because I was living in Florida at that time. Well, Mr. Elder, <clears throat> Mr. Nicholas, Mr. Player, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. This has been an extraordinarily special day at Augusta National. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your prompt attention. Thank you, bye-bye.